Hi, and welcome to another Behind the Poem story, where I tell you the inspiration or the stories or the moments that inspired the individual poems in my first collection, Between Hindsight and Foresight. Today's poem is called Inferior Half, and it's a play on words of the concept of someone being your better half. Obviously, there's some irony in that, and the original draft was, for me, written in high school. So as a teenager, we all grow up with the idea of um, being with others as friends or as a boyfriend-girlfriend situation. And there are certain things that are endemic to teenage love affairs or teenage angst in regards to our boyfriends and girlfriends. A lot of inferior half represents that angst, that frustration with the opposite sex. So for me, dating in high school was problematic. Uh, dating in middle school, dating in high school was, was problematic because I was not popular for a variety of reasons. Um, now, when I say popular, it's not to say that I didn't have a huge number of really fantastic friends that I'm still in contact with today. When I say popular, I mean it in the kind of media endorsed thing that you see on American television. Growing up in America, um, we know that while what you see in Europe and what we see as we are going through the middle and high school experience ourselves is a representation on screen of the TV and film that is not that far off from our reality. And as an adult, I can look back at the TV and films that are set in American high school and tell you that the events that occur, the, the things that happen to the main characters are not things that would really happen in their extremity. They are more hurtful, they are more destructive, more painful, more dramatic than they are in real life. But the socio-cultural aspect of American high school is very much accurately portrayed on screen. There is a social hierarchy. There is a level of acceptance and in-groups and out-groups and cliques um, that are accurately labeled, that are accurately portrayed in their way that people don't cross boundaries unless something really extreme happens, unless something really unusual happens. You kind of mix with your own groups and mixing with other groups is not accepted by most of the people that you're with in high school. So um, when I tell you that for me, dating in high school was difficult because I wasn't popular, it's because I wasn't part of the popular crowd, the in crowd, the high up social hierarchies, the ones that are getting voted for homecoming queen or for, in, in my case, senior sweetheart, the ones who were considered to be traditionally beautiful and physically attractive and therefore being chased by the physically beautifully attractive boys, um, that wasn't ever who I was. Um, I was a music geek, so part of the choir and the band, the marching band, with all the baggage that that comes with for expectations. Music geeks have a very stereotypical appearance, very stereotypical social status within American high school, and I wasn't that far off that. Um, I was also, however, an academic. I was a book geek. I was really bad at math, but I, I was obviously always into English. It was my favorite subject, and I was also considered a teacher's pet, which of course puts me into the geeky, nerdy, bookworm kind of category. So um, that meant that when times for school dances rolled around, or when social events were happening, I was kind of on the outskirts. I didn't want to go to a school dance without a date, but finding a date was not always possible. And also because of the gender roles and expectations of my growing up and just about everybody's growing up, was that the guy would do the chasing, the guy would do the asking for the date, for the dance, for whatever. And occasionally you'd get that new wave where a group of girls would go together as friends and then they would find people to dance with at the dance but that that was more rare um 
So this whole concept of being the gentler sex, of being the ones who are chased instead of the ones doing the chasing, that kind of really influenced and, and prevented any change in my social status as far as dating goes. So inferior half is kind of a immature and scathing kind of rebellion against those stereotypes. I was just so mad that because I didn't fit the media's portrayal of what was attractive, because I didn't fit what the cool kids wanted or what the cool guys wanted, the ones I wanted to date because I was attracted to them, did not look at me the same way because I wasn't the right fit. So inferior half is a very immature, very kind of rebellious statement against that. And any woman who's been fed a line in a bar or anybody who's been fed a line at school, uh, they know that this is how it goes and what we're, we're expected to respond to that kind of pursuit and just accept those stereotypes. Now, this frustration doesn't change when you get into adulthood. So one of the things I decided to do was to keep inferior half as close to the original draft as possible. That even though it's a, the concept is a little immature from a teenage girl's perspective of it's so unfair the guy I liked won't date me, that frustration has keeps going when you're an adult. It just the lines change and the scenes change, but the feeling is the same. Um, I have been told any number of things by any number of male friends who mean well, really honestly mean well, what I could change to make myself more attractive for men, what I could do to get a better date or, you know, get a date at all. Those sorts of things are, are really detrimental, not just to women, but to men too, because let's be fair, ladies they're as sexualized in the media as we are and the expectation that they look in a particular way the six foot chiseled jaw wide shoulders in the gym you know look is not as uh, is is just as unfair on them as the size eight slim waist you know high heels is to us so these these dating stereotypes this frustration with obeying the need to be something other than what you are um, to attract the other half is is just as bad for guys as it is for us. But this was my poem, so this was for us, ladies. Um, it's, it's really frustrating that that seeking need of love doesn't change. We still want it. We still feel like we have to change ourselves to get it. But if we change ourselves to get it, then we're not who we really are. That we should be able to get it by being who we are. Um, so anyone who has felt uh, that in, even in, in different and mature ways that, that boil down to that childish anger of wanting love and when we get it or when we get the date or when what we want falls short of that desire, we want to lash out. And most of the time we want to la lash out immaturely. So inferior half represents that part of my teenage years. It represents my adult frustration with dating. And I think it's you know appropriate because I've been talking to lots of my friends this week about finally standing up for themselves and finally not putting up with less than they deserve of holding out and making them work for it because we're worth getting what we want. So anyone I know that is still looking, hold out for the one who's worth it. Don't settle for an inferior half, whether it's a guy, a girl, or both. Just hold out for the actual better half and let the inferior half wait by the bar or by the phone and don't give them the time of day. Thanks for listening. Please keep watching the Behind the Stories videos. There are plenty more poems in the collection to go through. So on Monday, I will put up three more titles from the book, Between Hindsight and Foresight, on my Facebook page for that book. And you can help me decide what story you get to hear next Saturday. So look at the daily writing prompts that I'm putting on. Look at the poll for Monday. And I will see you next time I tell a story.